This is Arkansas 11, KTHB Little Rock. I'm Chuck Dovish. Photographer Larry Ellis and I decided it was time again to show you some of our most memorable experiences while traveling Arkansas during the past year or so. Segments that have aired on 11 Action News weekdays at 6 and 10 p.m. Our license plates tell us this is the land of opportunity, and many people who come here often stay. Why? Good land, warm-hearted people. The basics of good life. Take an Arkansas rice harvest, for example. A lot of meaning there in that same grain which not only feeds millions in this country, but in other countries as well. It stretches for miles from horizon to horizon in all directions, one of the richest rice producing regions in the world. And during this harvest season, our eyes are upon it, the Grand Prairie of Eastern Arkansas. I'm standing in what is one of the largest, if not the largest rice field in the world, a portion of a 12,000 acre field near Jonesboro. A golden sea alive with the food so many people depend on. There was a time when the Grand Prairie covered a half million acres of untouched land. That, of course, couldn't remain so because the land was too rich, too fertile to lie idle. And so it was put to use. Now this Grand Prairie plays a major role in helping to feed the world. Other crops grown in this soil also make their way into products sold worldwide. So why are we saying all of this? Well, sometimes when we have a mouthful, we need the words and pictures to go with it. Sometimes we have to stop and take a good, hard look at the men, machines, fields, water, and mud. Those who are out from sunup till sundown, gathering the food that'll feed millions. Those who make Arkansas number one at this sort of thing in this sea of golden delights. And that's why we're saying all of this. It's worth mentioning as often as possible. The good taste from the good earth, which happens to be right at home. It seems difficult to believe that just a few months ago we were diving off that bridge and into this creek trying to cool off from an Arkansas summer. It was one of those days when a fella just had to be a kid again. How far, heavy? <laughs> Traveling the back roads of Arkansas sure can pay off, especially on a hot summer afternoon. Going down Lawson Road near Salem, we ran into the Lawson Road Gang, as they call themselves, kind of like a spanky in our gang bunch who never really outgrew their mischief. Well, anyway, their swimming hole was our interest. I mean, a swimming hole is a swimming hole. Age just doesn't have any barrier, especially when you come across an old time bridge like this over a cool, refreshing creek. summer without the old swimming hole. And what's a swimming hole if it doesn't get your stomach up about to where your throat is? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Just thinking about that makes me cold. You know, there's a Hollywood, Arkansas, but Hollywood, California has also found its place in Arkansas. We'll show you what we mean right after this. Many folks from out of state have discovered the beauty in the land and people that Arkansas has to offer. One is Hollywood to film the most in-depth movie yet about the Civil War. D camera mark. Action. Action. 
It's the biggest motion picture ever undertaken about the Civil War. The Blue and the Gray in four parts lasting eight hours is CBS TV's biggie for the 1982 fall season. Viewership is expected to exceed that of Roots. What's going to happen now is on action, the Confederate troops are going to start to advance. Action. When you're trying to fight the Civil War all over again, things can get a little hairy. This is dangerous. There's two loads in here. Got it. From shooting a gun on the rookies to trying to handle a muzzleloader, Gerald DeLaughlin is earning his pay as an actor. And actually, I know a lot about a muzzleloader, but I haven't shot a muzzleloader since I was a kid. And I used to shoot it my own way. You know, I'd use the ramrod any darn way I please. I didn't know we were going to shoot this scene. I could have practiced and practiced on kicking myself. See, it's not in the script. It's, it's a great idea. But the person having the most problems is probably the director. Well, the difficulty, you know, are the logistics of uh, moving everybody around and all the troops and, uh, and uh, just the, the sheer length of shooting, you know. I mean, we're here a long time, and uh, we have to find a lot of locations, a lot of sets. They're so intense and so into it that... We, we tried saying cut, they don't understand that. We tried ceasefire, they don't understand that. Now we've got a guy that has to run in between the gunshots waving a white flag to try to get them to stop. I understand I may still have a chance in this movie. <laughs> you may still have a chance, Chuck. I mean, our casting to people said you did very well, and it came across my desk, and they said, well, we've got to find a line for this guy. We've got to find something for this man to do. He's too good. And I said, well, find it. And so we'll be here to Christmas, and we expect to see Chuck Doe's in the film yet. God bless you, miss. And that was it. Four words. God bless you, miss. After all the waiting, nervousness, anxiety, and insomnia. Ah, but look at the significance, the drama, the effect, the tears in the eyes of 50 million viewers next fall. Hooray for Hollywood. Speaking of the Civil War, combine that with all the tales of ghosts and haunted houses it seems many Arkansans just love to tell, and you have a story of a real haunted house? We visited this one on the night before Halloween. Built before the Civil War around three mineral springs on what is now Highway 270 West near Crystal Springs stands the house Mayberry Springs. It was built by a David Mayberry and served as the only stage stop between Hot Springs and Mount Ida. The way the story goes, when the Civil War broke out, David Mayberry joined on the side of the South. Before leaving, he and his body servant buried his treasure on this property. Later, the servant was roughed up by some men until he finally told them about one of the burial places under one of these pillars. Rumor now has it that the servant's ghost still guards the rest of the buried treasure. On any given night, it's been said the servant's ghost can be seen roaming around the grounds, at times standing guard on the footbridge near the house. Some unexplained incidents have taken place at Mayberry Springs. Several persons have told of hearing voices and the cry of a baby in the house and around the springs. One person was willing to tell us her experience. It wasn't too long till he said, uh, like as in, like as in a dissident. Something like that, and then, and then later on, it was like, like a baby, wah, 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 something like that, see? Other persons have said that when it rains, blood appears on the front steps and cannot be wiped away. Lights have been seen moving in the windows. Chains reportedly can be heard dragging across the front porch and in the attic. Also, at times, something very heavy can be heard dragging across the attic floor. And a few people have told of feeling a presence near them when entering the house. Well, we did manage to find one bona fide ghost, and even he, or she, didn't seem at all too thrilled to be inside. We scared ourselves on that one. Back during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and even the early 60s, there was a different type of hobo, if you will, who roamed the country, always having the same steady job. Here in Hot Springs, we found such a man, the sidewalk shoeshine man. He started shining shoes in a barber shop at Stuttgart when it used to be a nickel a shine. 
kept on shining for 53 years after that, and today he's still shining in Hot Springs by way of a sidewalk shoeshine stand in front of Jackson Newsmart. Jeff Davis, or J.D. as he likes to be called, will be 73 years old this Friday. He charges only 70 cents more than what his price was in Stuttgart in 1927. J.D. is a shoeshine man in the truest sense of the word, and you just don't find too many like him anymore. It's a lost art. Yeah, you do, cause see them young boys don't don't try to pick up on it down no more. See, when we were little, we just hung, we hung around the shine stand. Be glad to get the shine man shoes. And then they went for the nickel of shine. So we'd be glad to get the silver man. So we catch up on that. We go around back in the garage and shoot penny dice. <laughs> That's why I like. Cause the rest of the boys go around and get the gambling. I stay around the shine stand. Uh -huh. And when they come for a shine, when nobody be that shine but me, and so the man just let me shine. But my hardest job was to try to keep, to try to keep from getting uh, that black parts on them white socks. <laughs> and everybody back then was wearing white socks. J.D. was born in St. Charles, Arkansas. Before settling in Hot Springs 15 years ago, he shined shoes from one end of the country to the other. In many a barber shop, many a bus station, and on many a sidewalk. Shine shoes across the country. Well, I shine in Toledo, Ohio, and I shine in Hanford, Washington. I shine in Vancouver, Washington. I shine in Port Wyoming, California, and I shine in Los Angeles on Central Avenue and on 56th Street. I shine there. And from there, I come all the way back this way, shine. That's a lot of shoes. <laughs> oh, man, if I had a new pair of shoes, that's how I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> Even though J.D. never made a million, he did support a wife and three kids, two of whom went to college, all from shining shoes. There's nothing better than Arkansas apples. I don't care what Washington State says. There's also nothing better than Arkansas cider. You'll see what we mean in a moment. Harvest time means a lot of good things, not only to eat, but to drink. The process of making cider is always interesting to watch, a process that was handed down to Doyle Wilson of Gurdon. During harvest season in early America, there was a bit of tradition that went on around just about every homestead, making cider. The taste and aroma were unforgettable. Doyle Wilson of Gurdon has continued that same tradition in his family for the past 50 years. He began with his father's press, a 1900 model, which still stands on Doyle's front porch. Out in his backyard, there is a more earlier cider history. Carefully placed against a tree is an 1874 model, which Doyle says he just happened to find one day out in the field. A simple modified press is his way now of liquefying red, delicious apples. And you don't have to watch old Doyle too long before you notice the great amount of pride he puts into every drop of cider. Doyle also makes vinegar from his cider that, according to him, will make a pig squeal. But taking a sip of his real, honest-to-goodness cider is like taking a bite into a big, juicy apple. Well, I got my dad's old press out of the shop a couple of years ago and, and uh, rebuilt it and got interested. Of course, there's no apple raised around Gurdon. Mr. Norris up at Amity and uh, Mr. Uh, Adkins Ben, they fix me up. The apples we use, we pick them up off of the ground to make sure they're ripe. Some of them got blemishes, but don't seem to hurt the cider. Any? Seems like a lot of work uh, just to make some cider. Well, it's working anything is worthwhile.
And that's the final prize product right there, huh, Doyle? That's right. <laughs> That looks mighty fine coming out of there, mighty fine. Other than the apples, it's all come out. <laughs> Here's to you. Thank you. Yeah. Ah! If you overdo that thing, now you know. I'm <laughs> yeah, boy. I'm not going to be responsible <laughs> for any accidents. <laughs> Some of the best cider in these here parts of Arkansas, right here at. Doyle Wilson Cider Shed in Gurdon. You know, knowledge can come to us in many unique and interesting ways. For example, down by the railroad tracks in Hope, Arkansas, all you have to do is listen to William Tyree. My mama told me a long time ago that the last time she'd done the dog, it was a year and a half ago. She said, don't do that dog. The last time I done the dog, it was a year and a half ago, both of my knees and my tail is still so. <laughs> she said, don't go in that dog. <laughs> William Tyree of Hope, also known as the Hat Man, is gathering up his raw materials. From them, he'll make hats, rings, bracelets, necklaces, all sorts of various doodads and doohickeys. Now, some will tell you William Tyree is sort of an institution in Hope, an entertainer, a salesman. My motto is I walk a mile to make you smile, but if you frown, I'd rather leave town. That's that's why I put all that stuff on it. And I advertise. Just right now, I had different several necklaces. I want, I want that necklace. Yeah, okay. I said, I'm just advertising anyway. So that's all I got it on there for, just for fun, just for laughing, laughing, laughing. William Tyree was a well digger, a carpenter, and a farmer. But there's one thing that if you do right and hope, the watermelon capital of the world, you're loved by all. Didn't you used to grow some good, pretty good watermelons in Hope? Who oh, man, you must have heard about it. I grow a watermelon, man, shoot. One, uh, I, I, mean, I, I think one man in this world that I know of is meet me raising watermelon, that Middlebrooks. Man named Middlebrooks, stay in West Texas. And what's your secret? Uh, uh, to make raised watermelon? Okay. You, have you ever farmed? Uh, but anyway, you got a subsoil that you dig down in there to the subsoil. Put your fertilizer down there where it'll stay damp all the time and that watermelon will look green. Okay. If that sun is shining on it, that'd be, that'd be green pretty. William Tyree will be 81 years old October 14th. If you spot him passing through Hope, give him a wave. He may give you a good word or two. Yeah, boy. Rawhide, High Noon, Rio Grande, Red River, when westerns were westerns. In a moment, you'll meet a collector of those movies who doesn't want to forget. Oh. Remember the years of the singing cowboys? Cowboys who kids looked forward to and looked up to every week. When you could sit your child down in front of the TV set and not have to worry. Well, Don Moss of Brower still looks up to those singing cowboys. Westerns from the days when you could go see them for only 10 cents. Don Moss remembers them. He used to run the projector at the Deuce Theater in Rower before it closed in 1953. But Moss just couldn't bear to part with the Durango Kid, Lash LaRue, Tex Ritter, or Billy the Kid. So he started collecting all the classics along with the posters. And he's collected so many that his house, garage, trailer, and a shack are filled with them. Many are from the 30s and 40s, when two to three hundred westerns were made a year. Well, um, there was a lot of shooting and saloon fighting back then, which is not now. You seldom ever see a saloon fight in a, in a western now. But then there was a lot of saloon fights and gun fights, horse riding. And today it's just not like it was then. Whatever did happen to Randolph Scott and the others? Well, they're still around. They're 
some of them, some of them's passed away. And uh, we get them at the film festivals once in a while, the old timers that's left. Randolph Scott is alive and well and wealthy, living in California, as is Gene Autry. Singing his song of the trail When shadows creep Every story's got to have a happy ending. If you like what you've seen during the past half hour, join us for Traveling Arkansas weekdays during 11 Action News at 6 and 10 p.m., where stories do have happy endings with people who take pride in what they do. Hopefully, you'll be one of those persons we meet soon. Thank you and take care. 